Well, good afternoon. We have uh, two really terrific uh, presentations for today's Kansas Center Grand Rounds. And uh, we'll get right to it because I know we're a few minutes late. Uh, our first speaker, we're very fortunate to introduce Dr. Donald Lannon. And uh, Dr. Lannon, as you know, has uh, really been a, 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 a important leader in breast cancer at our center and, and before that at, at other centers as well. And um, I think uh, through his many accomplishments throughout his career, um, uh, a very timely one was his recent publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I suspect will be much of what we hear about in terms of understanding uh, the relationship between aggressive screening patterns and how we really manage breast cancer. So uh, Dr. Lannon is a professor of surgery uh, and, and ha served as the executive director of our breast center from 2002 to 2010. And his work uh, continues to have great impact in uh, management of breast cancer. So I'm pleased to have him speak to us today for his talk entitled The Myth of Early Detection of Breast Cancer. So thank you. Okay. Uh, a myth is defined as a story, the origin of which is forgotten, ostensibly historical, but usually such as to explain some practice, belief, institution, or natural phenomenon. Or another definition is an exaggerated or idealized conception of a person or thing. I kind of like this second one because it implies that there can be a grain of truth to it. And when I was a kid, every kid in America had a coonskin cap because of the myth of Davy Crockett. And there actually was such a person, but he probably didn't kill a bear when he was three and so forth. So that's part of the myth. Well, the thesis of my talk today is that uh, early detection of breast cancer is a myth. But it doesn't mean there's not a grain of truth behind it. There may be a little bit of truth behind it, but it's exaggerated and blown way out of proportion to the extent that it should be called a myth. Now, uh, it's very widespread, this myth. If you Google early diagnosis of breast cancer, I got 14 million hits. Or Google breast cancer screening, you get 34 million hits. Or in PubMed, there's 126,000 articles on breast cancer screening. So it's uh, very widespread, and I didn't review all these sites, but extensive sampling showed 99% in favor of early detection. Now, every one of these women thinks that because her cancer was picked up on a mammogram, that saved her life. What's the chance that that's really true? Well, I'm not going to go into all the vagaries of the screening mammogram trials and so forth, but a recent overview and uh, meta-analysis revealed that there's uh, about 19% reduction in uh, mortality from screening mammograms. So I'll accept that and I'll, uh, I'll say right off then there is some benefit to early detection. But I think my impression is 19% is actually very small. I work every day with our breast radiologists and they're so skilled, it's incredible the tiny little cancers they find. And uh, you know, I would think that it should be 50% or 75 or 90% mortality reduction, but it isn't. And uh, so one of the goals you know, of my work in the last few years is to try to figure out why. Now, uh, also, does that mean that 19% of the women that had a cancer diagnosed on mammogram are, are uh, saved? Well, not really. If you look at the natural history of cancers on a mammogram, the largest group by far is about 50% are slowly growing cancers that are curable when found on the mammogram, but would still be curable when they become clinically apparent. The next largest group is the slow growing cancers that will never become clinically apparent, in other words, the overdiagnosed cancers. Then there's about 20% of cancers that are rapidly growing cancers that are already incurable even when found on the mammogram. And then at most, there's 5% of all the invasive cancers on mammogram that might be curable when found in the mammogram and become incurable when they're found clinically. So at most 5% of those women really benefited. Now, so the myth is obviously very widespread. Why do physicians believe the myth? Well, we've known for 100 years that there's a, a variety of breast cancers. There's small ones, medium ones, and large ones. And for 100 years, we've known that tumor size is uh, very important in determining the survival of breast cancer. The uh, small cancers, oops, I need to go back, let me do that. Uh, the, 
the uh, small cancers uh, have a, a very good survival, the large ones not so good, and the medium ones in between. So tumor size has been part of every staging system for breast cancer for 100 years. But now for 90 of those 100 years, we thought that breast cancer was really one disease, that this small tumor invariably grew to this tumor and that invariably grew to this tumor. And what I'm going to tell you today is that's not really true. These are all different cancers. And it's actually fairly rare for this small tumor to grow into this cancer. And neither of these cancers will grow into this one. Large cancers grow in a different way that I'll show you in a minute. Now, so here's just a couple examples of small cancer diagnosed in 2008. If you look back, the same cancer was there unchanged in 2007, but they thought it was a fibroadenoma. And this is a very typical story. We'll see a woman diagnosed with a eight millimeter cancer, and then you look back at the previous mammogram and you see the cancer not quite as big, and you look back two years before and the cancer's there, but not quite as big. So it's growing very slowly. Now the lead time is the time it would take for that cancer to become palpable and diagnosed without the benefit of mammography. And it's pretty easy to see that that this cancer would probably take 10 or more years to become palpable and, and diagnosed clinically. So uh, there's a significant percent of small cancers that grow very slowly and can be seen in retrospect on previous mammograms. Now there's uh, some that are interval cancers. Here's a lady that she had a previous cancer, forget that, but she was diagnosed with a new triple negative cancer that became palpable in August 2011. You can see the little triangle means it was palpable. She had had a mammogram five months earlier that had been read as normal. But if you look back on one view only, you can actually see a small nodule. Now this would be, seem to be the exception, you know, a small cancer that turned into a big cancer, and that does rarely happen. But the reason it doesn't happen very often is to find this cancer at this stage, you had to get that mammogram in March. If you got it in January, you probably wouldn't see it at all. And if you got it in May, you know, it would already be well on the way to be in here. So it's actually very rare that these faster growing cancers show up as, at this stage on mammogram. So another significant percent grow very quickly, present as interval cancers, and are unlikely to be found on the mammogram. Then I promised I'd tell you how did large cancers grow. Well, for years I thought that if this cancer is a 10 centimeter cancer, that there had to be a time when that was a five centimeter cancer, or a two and a half centimeter cancer. And I thought, well, the woman either is in denial and ignoring it, or she's just very unaware of her body. You know, I couldn't really explain it. And then uh, I realized that I was wrong on all counts. The, uh, I had a couple very articulate patients that are very observant, and they explained to me very well the large area in their breast, uh, just the whole grapefruit size area became hard, and it just got harder and harder, and eventually it burst. And then I realized how that happened. Well, there's really two different growth patterns. The one we think of for cancer is a cancer just progressively gets bigger. But what happens in these large cancers is the cancer very early at an in situ stage or, or T1 stage spreads out and is multifocal. And then the in situ cancer becomes multifocal stage one cancer, and then it skips stage two, and all these little foci coalesce into a large cancer very quickly in stage three. So here's an example of it. You can see uh, all the calcifications are evidence of the in situ disease. And then the multiple nodules are evidence of multifocal invasive cancer that still would be considered stage one. But then very quickly, this whole area coalesces into a large invasive cancer that's stage three. And you can see that on, on MRIs very well. You see the multifocal cancers, and here's one that pathologically was already a four centimeter cancer, but the MRI is kind of like archeology. span It shows what it used to be, and you can still see the individual fo foci. Here you can see it clinically. If you look at this lady's tumor, you can see individual little uh, tumors growing up in these nodules. And so they're uh, just coalescing into a large cancer. So in summary, a significant percent grow very slowly, can be seen on previous mammograms, 
The other significant percent grow quickly, present of interval cancers, unlikely to be found on mammogram. And then a significant number of large cancers grow by type 2 growth with early multifocal seeding, and then they frequently skip stage 2. So what's happened with breast cancer screening over the last 35 years, my whole professional career, we've really emphasized breast cancer screening and mammography. Well, in 2016, Gil Welsh and colleagues wrote a very important article where they looked at what was happening. And what they found is during the 80s, when screening mammography became widespread, the incidence of small tumors, here's one to two centimeters, here's in situ, and here's less than one, the incidence of these small tumors went up very sharply. The incidence of the large tumors, you know, uh, two to three, three to four, and greater than five, went down a little, but not as much. So that the small tumors increased over three times more than the large tumors decreased. This suggests that some small tumors do not progress to large tumors. Among invasive tumors, this rate of overdiagnosis was 22%. Now, Dr. Shi Wang and I were interested in following up on this and trying to understand how this happened and get some supporting evidence for it. So we asked the question, are small breast cancers good because they are small or small because they are good? And uh, what we did is pick some biological parameters. And we use grade ER and PR. Now these are very primitive biological parameters, but we used them because they're in SEER since about 1990, where the more uh, sophisticated ones, HER2 and uh, Oncotype and so forth, either aren't in SEER or they came along much later. But then using these primitive measures, we were able to divide the biology of the cancers into favorable, intermediate, and unfavorable. And what we found is that when we looked at uh, the biology compared to tumor size is that the small tumors were much more likely to have favorable biology and unlikely to have unfavorable. But as the tumors were larger, there a lot less of them are favorable biology and a lot more are unfavorable. Now this is for women over 40. For women under 40, it's a similar pattern, but without mammography, uh, there's not very many small tumors and they're not as likely to be favorable. So. Uh, many small tumors are small not because they were detected early, but because they have favorable biology and are slow growing. Large tumors do not arise equally from all small tumors, but arise from a subset with unfavorable biology. Now we were interested in the survival and uh, the relationship of tumor size and biology. And you see both biology and tumor size are important for survival. but. Uh, we developed a couple principles that are probably true of other more sophisticated measures of biology as well. One is a large tumor with favorable biology can have a better prognosis than a smaller tumor with unfavorable biology. But the difference in survival by, by uh, tumor size is less for the biologically favorable tumors than for the unfavorable tumors. And this probably applies to oncotype as well. If you look at the Taylor RX trial, the uh, very favorable tumors, more favorable than these, about 10%, there's no difference at all in the uh, T1 or T2 tumors in survival. But they haven't yet published the unfavorable tumors, but I'm thinking that there probably will be a difference there. Now, uh, how about overdiagnosis? Well, first of all, I need to define these terms. The lead time is the time from when the cancer becomes detectable on mammogram to when it's detectable clinically. And you see the slower growing cancers have much longer lead times, where the fast growing cancers have very short lead times. Now, in some cases, the lead time may be 10 years, and it may exceed the life expectancy, maybe less. So the uh, good diagnosis over diagnosis is when the lead time exceeds the life expectancy. That's the definition. Now, uh, Etzioni et al. Uh, pointed out that if life expectancy and either the rate of overdiagnosis or the lead time is known, the other can be calculated. They used previous value of lead time of 39 months to calculate that the overdiagnosis rate should be 8%. But what we did, and what I should say is what Dr. Wang did, is uh, use the rate of overdiagnosis that Welch found of 22%, and then uh, 
estimate various models of where that falls into the favorable and intermediate and unfavorable biology, and then calculate the lead times. So Dr. Wang was kind enough to give up pretty much his Christmas vacation last year and develop a whole set of models looking at uh, the relationship. And it's not quite as easy as I showed because you have to look at the distribution and the uh, nor normality of the curves and so forth to do that. But I uh, was able to estimate the lead times. Now, if 22% of the patients are overdiagnosed, I mean, we have to be able to see them in one of these three categories. And it seems more likely that the, the favorable tumors are going to be more overdiagnosed than the unfavorable ones. But we did a variety of models looking at the distribution of overdiagnosis and also uh, whether it was 22% as Welch had found or maybe a little less, 16.5% or 11%. So we considered a few uh, possibilities there. And what we found is the uh, lead times, for example, for the uh, favorable ones were quite long and for the unfavorable ones very short. And the lead times varied quite a bit in the different models, but it was always about an order of magnitude longer for the favorable tumors than the unfavorable tumors. And uh, so this is what, it used to be thought that the lead time was three or four years and we knew there was some variation. So maybe a fast tumor, the lead time would be one or two years and a slow one, it'd be five or six years. But in fact, what we found is it's really, there's a lot with very short lead times and a lot with very long lead times. And these data explain both how mammography causes overdiagnosis and why its effectiveness is limited. Because of the long lead times, mammography is very good at detecting favorable tumors. However, many of these do not progress and contribute substantially to overdiagnosis. Furthermore, those favorable tumors that do progress have an excellent prognosis even when large, so the benefit of early detection is limited. In contrast, the prognosis for the unfavorable tumors is much better if they are small, but because of the short lead times, they are rarely detected and are underrepresented among small tumors. Now, uh, these models that Dr. Wang developed are so elegant, you know, we've known for the past several years that there were some percent of breast cancers that were overdiagnosed, but we never really knew who or what types, and, and these models can show us. It's, it's greater in the elderly patients and especially with favorable tumors. So for the first time, we can kind of appreciate who's overdiagnosed. And that actually, I think, can be useful clinically. If we have a lady in the 70s with a grade one ERPR positive tumor, the chance is about 60% that that's an overdiagnosed cancer. So it makes it at least much easier for me to treat that lady less aggressively. Now, uh, the SEER data we looked at didn't actually have uh, any indication of which cancers were diagnosed by mammography. We sort of assumed that. But we actually did a study using our Yale database. One of the students I worked with looked at uh, the Yale patients and there we did have the, the method of detection. And we could do multivariable analysis with tumor stage and age and race and so forth. And found that we didn't divide them up exactly the same way. But if we look at the triple negative cancers, the aggressive cancers, compared to a self-detected palpable mass, the uh, screening was much less likely to find them. Where if we looked at the uh, favorable ERPR positive cancers, screening was much more likely to find it. And similarly with stage, if we looked at high stage tumors, clinically uh, the screening was much less likely to find them, where the low stage tumor screening was more likely to find them. So uh, a summary so far is although there may be a small benefit to early detection, it is greatly overestimated both by medical and lay personnel and exaggerated to the point that it should be considered a myth. Most of the perceived benefit of early detection is really due to variation in tumor biology. Now in the last few minutes, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the disadvantages of the myth. One is obviously the patient, and this has been talked about before, there's some harms from screening, additional medical visits, unnecessary biopsies in women without cancer, and for those with overdiagnosed cancers, you get all the treatment uh, side effects that are unnecessary. But what I'm actually a little more interested in is how the myth subtly influences how we practice. And uh, we get you know, a lot of six-month follow-up mammograms, ultrasounds, MRIs for minor low-risk indications because we're so afraid of missing a cancer. That myth makes us think it's just essential we don't miss it by six months. 
as a surgeon, I operate on breast cancers, but even more than that, I take out lesions that are atypical on a, on a needle biopsy because a small percent, maybe 5% of those, will get upgraded to either DCIS or cancer. But the medical wisdom is you, if you can find it right then, you want to find it right then. You don't want to wait you know, a year or two and see which ones actually develop a cancer. I mean, the survival is probably the same, but, uh, but because of that, we take out all those atypias. The story of screening ultrasound, I think, is fascinating. It, it deserves a half an hour talk. Turns out the only thing we know about screening ultrasound is occasionally you will find a cancer that way that doesn't show up in the mammogram. But we don't know, you know, some of the data I went over quickly suggests that the screening ultrasound detected cancers are more likely overdiagnosed than even the screening mammogram cancers. And uh, what we really don't know is if we just waited, you know, a year or two and uh, let the cancer show up in mammogram, would the results be just as good? But uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, physicians didn't have to do it, but the legislators in Connecticut all know that early detection of breast cancer is so important that they passed a law without any data at all that uh, showed that you had to not only tell women about the option of screening ultrasounds, but insurance had to pay for them. So uh, that's without any data, but just based on the myth of early detection. And then finally, the last thing is I want to talk a minute about some legal uh, situations. Delay in diagnosis of breast cancer is the most common condition resulting in malpractice claims against physicians and the second most expensive in terms of indemnity dollars. In my experience, these suits usually result from unrealistic expectations based on the myth of early diagnosis. In most of these suits, an expert guesses at what the patient's stage could have been and then uses staging charts to testify what the patient's prognosis would have been if diagnosed at that stage. Now, is this valid? Well, if you look at the results, these are, are similar. I'm having a little trouble with this. These are similar results to uh, you know, our other chart. If you look at the T1, the smaller tumors, they're more likely favorable, less likely unfavorable, where the T2 are, more, are less likely favorable and more likely unfavorable. Now, if you, uh, overall, the difference in survival is 94% versus 78%, and these are the survivals for each group, subgroup. But what you really want to know is not the overall survival here, but if this tumor that grew to a T2 tumor were found when it was T1, what would have been the survival? It wouldn't be the average survival here. You'd, what you can do is actually uh, take the, the population fraction that's T2 and apply the, the survival from T1 and see what it would have been. And it would have been not 94%, but 92%. Now, that's not a big difference, but remember, the difference is only 16%. So it's over 10%. So grade ER and PR account for about 10% of the difference in survival between T1 and T2. But remember, these are very primitive estimates of biology. If we could do this with Oncotype, it'd be interesting. Or uh, many of the unidentified, uh, or currently being identified biological factors, all of those will distribute this way. They'll all be more common in smaller tumors. And so this 10% uh, probably is much greater, but it's unknown at this point. We don't know how much greater. Now, another way to look at this is if you look at you know, uh, stage one cancers, nobody lives 94% of the time. What that means is six out of those 100 patients are destined to die of their breast cancer, but you don't know which six. Now, stage two, it's, it's up to 22%. But now what you want to know, you know these cancers have progressed from stage T1 to T2, but what you want to know is if these cancers had been found here, what would have been the survival? Well, it wouldn't be the survival of the whole group because uh, you know a large percent of those T1 tumors do not progress at all to T2. So it would have been somehow the survival of this over this, and it'd be about twice the uh, mortality of, of what we predict just from stage one. So an important principle is staging data are useful for prospectively estimating the prognosis for a group of patients going forward. It is not valid to use staging data to retrospectively estimate what an individual patient's prognosis would have been. Attempting to do so will usually overestimate the value of early detection. Now, the last thing I want to 
do is ask that all the physicians in the audience, especially the medical oncologists, if you have a patient with a poor prognosis, don't tell her that it's too bad the breast cancer was not diagnosed earlier. I uh, consult sometimes for, for some of these law uh, malpractice suits. And a couple years ago, I had a sad case, a 25-year-old girl that uh, had uh, a very poor prognosis breast cancer. And if you look at it, it was stage two growth. She had DCIS through the breast and multifocal invasive cancer, a lot of positive nodes and so forth. And she was treated at a very famous uh, cancer center in Boston and by a very excellent medical oncologist. And the lawyer asked her, did any of your doctors ever tell you that your prognosis would have been better if this had been diagnosed earlier? And she looked kind of confused and she said, well, yes, almost all of them told me that. And I think how sad that is that at one of our best cancer centers, the medical oncologists mislead this poor girl into thinking that something could have been done to uh, prevent her from dying of this breast cancer when it just wasn't the case. What they should have said is, it's just too bad that your breast cancer wasn't one of those little, round, solitary, slow-growing ones. But it wasn't, and it never was. So in conclusion, early detection plays a very minor role in the outcome of breast cancer. The most important factor by far is the underlying tumor biology. We should stop using the terms early and late and should classify breast cancers as favorable or unfavorable. And we do not need more breast cancer awareness. What we need in Connecticut in 2017 is breast cancer education. And part of that education should be teaching physicians, patients, and the public about the limitations of early detection. Uh, thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Lana? Yeah. Well, if there is a real 20% reduction in mortality, what is the next step? How do we focus our technology on the cancers that are there? Well, that's, that's an excellent question, and I think, uh, you know, we all want to know more about the tumor biology. I think ultimately that's the answer. We need to, to uh, be able to tell the prognosis more in the tumor biology. We're going that direction. You know, the new staging, the eighth edition of the staging manual is really radically different, incorporating a lot of the factors that I've shown in tumor biology into it. It's, uh, you know, in terms of screening, I'm not advocating not doing mammogram screening. But we might consider stopping at age 70. You know, if you look at the overdiagnosis in women over 70, that gets very high and the benefit gets very low. So that might be a consideration. Other questions? Is there any hint or any um, uh, biological, uh, toward biological methods of distinction on favorable and unfavorable? Well, I think you'd know more about that than I would. And, well, and there's. Uh, I don't know of any. I thought maybe you do. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of things being studied. It's always difficult to get them in large databases like SEER where you can really be real precise about it. But, you know, there's lots of smaller studies looking at all sorts of biological uh, variables and, and I think in the long run that's... The, the classification, I guess, the first time I said sort of that you're making up unfavorable versus favorable as opposed to stage or grade or anything else. Yeah. It seems like a, that's... That, is that a new classification and is that important to it other than that? Not really. It's one I made up, basically. But, but I mean, yeah, I think you can do it with any. Yeah, I mean, I think you can do it with any set of biological variables, and and if you use archetype or mammogram things like that, you can probably be much more precise than than just grade and ERPR. Yeah. Do, do you yeah. look at any features of the patients as opposed to the tumor? Uh, a little bit, but there's only so much available in SEER, so. Uh, you know, not extensively. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll try to close this out here. And, uh, Thanks. You. So our, our next speaker is Dr. Vasilis Vasilou, who is a department chair and professor of epidemiology and environmental health, as well as a professor of ophthalmology, and his his research is certainly internationally recognized, including areas of cellular responses to environmental stress, gene-environment interactions, and pharmacogenetics, and his, I'm opening up your talk, I think, yes.
And his talk today is Advancing Cancer Treatment by Aldehyde Dehydrogenase Inhibitors. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, and I'm going to start from the first question, and I'm going to start talking a little bit about tumor biology um, in my talk. So essentially, I'm going to try to explain to you what's going on with aldehyde dehydrogenases and cancer treatment. As uh, being Greek in origin, I would really like to mention that the uh, origin of the word cancer comes, of course, from uh, the Greek word. And don't quote me, again, the Greek, uh, big, big Greek fat wedding. Uh, but this is the truth. Kankinos was the name, and cancer it was coming from the crab, which essentially was the crab was trying to, to eat and kill Hercules when he was trying to kill the beast. Anyway, this is kind of the etymology of the work. So again, I'm going to start similar like Don, but I'm going to tell you about aldehyde dehydrogenases in cancer and cancer stem cells. These are two different terms which I can explain in great details, but looking at the new version of the search uh, best match on PubMed, you can see we have 2,064 uh, hits with aldehyde dehydrogenase and cancer, uh, and cancer. And if we can, you know, make it a little bit more general, it comes almost to 2,500 publications. If you screen for aldehyde dehydrogenase and stem cells, you have already 12, uh, 1,200 publications and more on this. So what is aldehyde dehydrogenase and what we're talking about? Aldehyde dehydrogenases are a, a, a family of enzymes which catalyze a very simple reaction. The aldehyde goes to carboxylic acid with NAD and NTPH. Aldehydes in general are very potent electrophiles. They can adduct DNA. They can adduct uh, a lot of, um, can cause covalent binding, lipid peroxidation, glutathione depletion, which essentially cause protein damage, uh, membrane destruction, oxidative stress, which will lead to um, toxicity and disease. So um, in addition to just having this catalytic activity, they have three more catalytic activities. I'm not going to go to great details, but we have aldehyde oxidation, ester hydrolysis, and reduction of nitrates. They also generate NADPH, which is a very critical uh, molecule, not only for normal cells, but also for cancer stem cells, which increases the intercellular levels of glutathione. They, uh, through the recycling of GSH uh, through GSHG. In addition to that, and this is very important for the cancer uh, tumor biology, they have a non-catalytic function, and this is they can act as direct antioxidant, they can absorb UV um, and radiation, and they also have binding capabilities. They can bind even to chemotherapeutic agents, decreasing the capability of treatments. So how many aldehyde dehydrogenases we have in humans? There are 19, 16, uh, 19 distinct genes with different chromosomal localization, and unfortunately I don't have the time to go through all that, but we have plenty of reviews. You can find out uh, everything that is there, or you can request more uh, information. So what I was telling you about ALDHs and cancer, a lot of them are involved in either cancer stem cell or overly expressed in several tumors. And this is the list of, again, of ALDHs involved in uh, cancer. So everybody here knows that you can use aldehyde dehydrogenase activity to just isolate cancer stem cells. And cancer stem cells, uh, this, was, um, this was a probe, was a fluorescent probe that was added to an aldehyde, which they, if it can get to the cell, and the cell has high aldehyde dehydrogenase activity, it gets metabolized to an acid which is trapped within the cell. And you can use this as um, uh, in, a, in the fax analysis using that as a, as a probe, and then with the addition of um, an inhibitor, you can isolate the cells that they have high ALDH activity. And in most of the cases, this could be something between 0.5 to 1% of the total tumor, if, with exception of a few other tumors that you have high incidence of aldehyde dehydrogenase. But essentially, the general scenario which I want to show you is that you have the entire tumor. You have a breast tumor here which goes under treatment. Uh, either this could be chemotherapy, radiation, a combination, whatever. You think that all this tumor has been gone, but just a few cells have been uh, alive, which you cannot detect. And those cells can, again, give proliferation to the to cancer remission or metastasis. 
And this is really important because you think that you have treated tumor in here, but the tumor has not really been gone. There are studies that have shown even 50, uh, 5 to 50 cells, cancer stem cells with high ALDH activity, they're capable of forming tumors very easy, very fast and much faster than the cells isolated with the surface markers, the CD markers of uh, cancer stem cells. So, I'm sorry, it's going here. So what, what do they do in there? What's the role they play? We have, uh, we've done several, uh, several res I mean, research on the role, and one of the things is everybody speculates that aldehyde dehydrogenase are in area signaling and, uh, and, and, and stress response. But also, if you can see from this uh, screen, I'm trying to stay here because the microphone works better. Uh, the ALDHs block essentially the reactive oxygen species and uh, aldehyde dehydrogenases, which, aldehyde, which these all species, they can cause DNA damage, they can alter gene expression, signaling, protein damage, and mitochondrial damage. This picture is just to show you the ALDH. If you isolate ALDH positive and negative cells, look at the spheroid formation. This is from pancreatic cells. We have published that very recently. You can see the growth tumor here and here. So essentially here is very small compared to that. And this is just ALD, if you take the tumor and you isolate ALD, it's positive and negative. So this is what I'm going to focus here, how we can treat those <coughs> cells to kill them completely. So DNA damage is start picking up a lot of interest lately, but we have studied that since 2005, and that's actually why I'm also a professor in ophthalmology, because in half of my life I'm, I also work with corneal crystallines, which are proteins expressed in the eye. So uh, regulating cell cycle and checkpoint, we published it in 2005 before everybody else went to talk about ALD, ALDHs and aldehydes and, um, and DNA damage and DNA repair. This was a paper in, J, in um, JBC which we indicated that ALDHs can prolong the cell cycle, enable the cells to be more resistant to DNA damaging agents. So the second activity is through the autophagy an autophagy inhibitor chloroquine markedly reduces the uh, cancer stem cell population and has been found to be a very strong inhibitor of aldehyde dehydrogenase. I don't know if you heard about the case of a Colorado girl which was actually sent home because none of the treatment was working for her brain tumor. It was glioblastoma. And then she was treated with chloroquine and a combination of drugs. And this girl is almost completely cured, completely cured I think. So a lot of potential here for the inhibition of ALDHs. We have shown, and I'm going to get back to there, that aldehyde dehydrogenases can contribute to the growth of the tumors by providing acet uh, the acetate as a fuel for the tumor. And finally, uh, we have the cancer cell metabolism. So I have to show you two bad papers that have been published in, uh, in really big journals such as Nature and Cell. And I want to show you the quality of the bad research which has been published, and I don't know which people they review this paper. So the whole idea, again, is that you have the environment and the metabolism everywhere. You have the acetaldehyde here. Acetaldehyde is the major product of alcohol we drink on, you know, in wine and so on. So the acetaldehyde can cause DNA damage in here. And then if you have the DNA repaired, impaired, such as Farconi anemia pathway, then you can have a bunch of... Uh, Problems are here, developmental defects, bone marrow failure, cancer, and so on. So from this paper, you know, the only one thing was the in vitro exposure to, I mean, the in utero exposure to ethanol. However, I want to draw your attention to this slide in here. And they propose that acetaldehyde, you know, causes um, the death of the cells. I want to draw your attention to the doses that they have used for acetaldehyde. It's in the millimolar range. Millimolar range and the effectiveness is at the really high levels, eight millimolar. Just to give you an idea, when you have a glass of wine or two or even three, the maximum levels that you can detect uh, in your blood of acetaldehyde is about 40 to 60 micromolars at the most. So you can understand that this is a nature paper that they've used eight millimolar. If you find any biological uh, setting with eight millimolar acetaldehyde, I'm going to quit that, I'm going to become a slim farmer. Second paper, which was also in cell, and it was really, I thought it was really good and bright idea, was that acetaldehyde can reduce the half-life of BRCA2, so enable the people to be susceptible to tumor, uh, to tumor growth through their genomic instability. I said, beautiful. And I started reading the paper, 
which was actually recently published. So the idea is acetaldehyde decreases the stability of BRCA2. And again, look at this data in here. This is again a cell paper, which indicates essentially that the, the protein, the BRCA2, starts getting low in concentrations from 8 to 10, and essentially getting 30 millimolars of acetaldehyde. So I'm going to start here. I'm going to rest the case. You cannot find this concentrations, not even if you inject this kind of amounts of acetaldehyde. So um, I have developed this hypothesis for the fuel uh, acetate for tumors based on these two papers that was published in uh, December of uh, 2014 in, in, in a cell also. And they indicate that acetaldehyde essentially because you have here most of the glucose goes to the uh, glycolytic pathway very quickly in here and it doesn't go through the mitochondrial pathway is that acetate can be used by ketyl, uh, acetyl cysteine uh, synthase to form a ketyl coenzyme A which can go for histone acetylation enzyme and biosynthesis of fatty acids. So in other words acetaldehyde can be used as a fuel for tumor cells. And we have shown throughout a lot of studies I don't have time to show you. I think I have one slide to show you. By inhibiting aldehyde dehydrogenase and increasing the levels of this, we completely block the growth of the tumor. So, and this is the, our hypothesis, which I'm going to discuss it again in here. You have the ingestion and the microbiome gives rise to acetaldehyde. You have this ILDH for uh, forming acetate, and then they can form this for treatment. This is on pancreatic tumors that I told you we published that last year. This is really high expression of the ILDHs. On, on the pancreatic cells, the same thing in colon cancer. So my hypothesis here is that you have acetaldehyde generated by all these processes, including glucose metabolism, methanol microbiome, and of course, beta oxidation. In addition to the tumor environment, you have a uh, hypoxic conditions. We have increased reoxidative oxygen species, increased lipid peroxidation, so about 400 aldehyde species generated in there, including the most active aldehydes, four hydroxynormal, and manual dialdehyde. Both, all these aldehydes can cause DNA damage, DNA repair, genomic instability, and apoptosis. We can use this to our advantage to treat the tumor. We can kill the tumors by just having increased of ALDH. Because if you don't, ALDH uh, metabolize those aldehydes, we have genomic instability. In tumors, in addition, acetaldehyde, if it's metabolized by ALDH, can go to acetate and can uh, serve as a biosynthesis and regulation of the tumor. So the major target is here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to inhibit these ALDHs as a measure of uh, increasing the chemotherapy and radiation and essentially every kind of tumor. So oxidative stress actually is not really bad. We have pilot pattern and we have, in collaboration with uh, Clayton Smith in the University of Colorado, we have shown a number of papers that uh, target the therapy to acute myeloid leukemia uh, in cells that in people that they lack expression of ALDH1. So when you don't have ALDH1A1, in these people is you can have an increased treatment by treating with 4 hydroxynonanol and also anything, uh, 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 and also this is arsenic trioxide, and of course your cytotherapeutic agent, you cause DNA damage and you can really cause death. So we have, as I said, we have patterned that and we, have, uh, we uh, are in clinical trials on this. A beautiful paper came similar again on the BRCA2 and it was shown this time and here's what I was saying bad science and good science. Look at this the uh, acetaldehyde here is at the level of 0.1 micromolar that they can give you know really a 0.1 millimolar which is 100 micromolars you can start to exist. This is much more logical experiments and this is a group that we are working but we are also uh, working on that uh, here at my, uh, my lab. So Several years ago, when I still was in Colorado Cancer Center, uh, I collaborated with Chris Austin, and I hosted Chris Austin, I think, last year, in talking about the MCAT. So the major thing was how to develop inhibitors of aldehyde dehydrogenase so we can increase the efficacy of all current chemotherapies or radiotherapies. And with that, again, it was the whole idea. We screened about 240,000 compounds library using an aldehyde dehydrogenase enzymatic activity, to make a long story short, we're going all the way through here, and we essentially developed two chemotypes for aldehyde dehydrogenase. We tested those, the cherry picks, about 200 for the, all the enzymes. Those are enzymes we produce in my laboratory, and we have done 
all the answers uh, will come. The chemotype one, chemotype two, chemotype one has been already uh, patterned. However, in our hands, it did not work very well in in vivo or ex vivo settings. In other words, it was working very well in vitro inhibiting, but most likely these were not very strong inhibitors or uh, they were defensible inhibitors. We couldn't see effects in culture. We couldn't see in any preclinical setting. With that, you know, I helped them developing the chemotype 2, which we just filed for a patent. We have a beautiful inhibitors of 10. And if anybody would like to use this in your current settings, you're very welcome. And um, again, it's a collaboration with MCATS. I have those 10 compounds, the most strong compounds, and in our hands now, work very well as in ex vivo. And what we're doing is essentially we have uh, the spheroid acid formation that we're using that in a combination and we can try that. We have tried in several colon cancer, uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, colon cell lines. So as I said, this is the chemotype one and then also in collaboration with Hanikaz we have developed this alveofloor high throughput screening which makes our life much easier compared to what we had before. So I'm gonna end up with a little bit and I actually wanna introduce you the uh, center of metabolomics we have, and I'm going to show you what we're doing right now in terms of calcium biology and calcium metabolism and also the role of aldehyde heterogenesis. So what uh, system approach that we use here is we're taking human colon cancer cell lines. I'm taking here the colon 320. We're using either knockdown, you can see the knockdown of the ALDH is almost at 90, more than 95%. And we're using the 10 inhibitors that I told you, and also we isolate cells based on ALDH positive and negative, because there are more than two aldehyde dehydrogenization centers here. One of the things, I don't want to go to details, but we are doing metabolomics, rna seq and proteomics. We're almost done with all these assays in here. We're waiting for metabolomics to have a complete story, but it's very compelling, comp a compelling story. But the DNA damage is picking up with proteomics, especially on this in here. It comes up as a top, top pathway, and you know, it's very exciting. So for metabolomics, essentially, you're taking those positions, either plus or negative or inhibitors. You run them through the chromatograph, and you get the analysis in here. You run them through the mass specs, and give you all the pathway analysis, and you confirm everything with um, targeted metabolomics. So one of the reasons that I moved here to Yale from Colorado was I wanted to develop this center for metabolomics, especially for this project. And you can get some really beautiful data. You can see the separation with the inhibitors in here on two different groups which indicate you know, how fast things it's working. So as I told you, I came here, I want to develop this center for metabolomics. I have uh, already purchased um, the four equipment for three, plus one it's coming is, this is the um, Zivo Qtof from Waters, which is used for untargeted metabolomics. We can have your samples, we can do the discovery and then whatever we found, we can go and quantify those in the quad, triple quadruple, uh, which is the targeted metabolomics. We also have the excellent uh, untargeted um, uh, metabolomics, uh, the GCMS, which we can use for this. And in addition to that, I have uh, Waters want to provide me with $1.5 million equipment to do tissue imaging and electronic. This is gonna be installed in the next couple of weeks in here. And we hosted uh, a couple of weeks ago, tissue imaging mass spectrometry and I want to thank also the uh, Cancer Center being one of the sponsors that, of that uh, symposium, which was fantastic. And we have a paper um, describing all the proceedings of this meeting, and it will be available to everybody. In addition to that, I have recruited Caroline Johnson, um, assistant professor. She's in my department. She also got her cute off in here, which is part of our center. And uh, then we also have, uh, I just recruited another assistant professor. And, uh, in uh, exposure assessment, which is she's getting a GCQ top. So we're going to have six powerful machines available here. We don't have it as a four yet. We're announcing the center very often, but I am willing to discuss collaborative project, the projects and also to be a service of the cancer center with that. With that, I think I am very good in time, and I want to thank essentially my collaborators from Colorado and that we have worked together for all these years and also Rolando Garcia Millen here which is uh, an amazing fellow helping us on all integrated pathways especially when you try to combine 
RNA seq metabolomics and proteomics and trying to find pathways through all these uh, three different omics facilities. Thank you so much. I know I have to speed up a little bit, but I think I covered everything. Covered it all. Questions? questions? Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes.